So I would love to uh, show you and um, share with you some of these experimental results that we have obtained over the last years, working with trapped ions. And uh, in honor of uh, Serge and his co-workers, I chose to have the title Exploring the Quantum with Ion Traps. And what I would like to show you today is first some historic remarks how ion traps appeared as a tool for quantum optics and spectroscopy. We have heard already some of that in Serge talks before. And uh, just how we apply the Powell trap, as I'll show you in a minute, to quantum physics. Then I would love to turn to some work that we did, uh, and we do still in Innsbruck, and I would like to apply this to quantum computation. So I would love to introduce you first to quantum computers. Why do we actually want to do that? I will share with you some uh, bits and pieces, in this case quantum bits and quantum pieces like quantum registers and quantum gates. And then we see how to explore the quantum, in particular by using quantum computation with trapped ions. I'll introduce to you briefly the quantum toolbox that we have available, and as one of the applications, I will probably not have more time, I'll show you how to perform quantum simulations, also alluded to by Serge already in his talk. And if there is time enough, in the end, we can see how the future will be, and uh, how we see how the ion trap quantum computer can be scaled. All of that research is going on at the University of Innsbruck, together with the Academy of Sciences Institute on Quantum Optics and Quantum Information at Innsbruck. So let's get started. As said before, exploring quanta, of course, has been applied for many years now by the group of Serge and Jean-Michel Raymond, and you know the famous book, Exploring the Quantum, where they deal with atoms in cavities and photons. So the entire system is what they have been written for a long time, and they've explored their quantum physics with is the, such a system. We are going to replace that system, and that's also already written in the book, by what we call a trapped the ion trap or trapped ion. So this is a single atom trapped in this device with the uh, uh, electromagnetic forces, and uh, we just investigate them with lasers and do laser cooling, also alluded to by Serge already in his introduction. This all started, this ion trap business, in 1956 by Wolfgang Paul, and this is in German, I apologize for that, but that's the original uh, publication in a very obscure uh, edition here. Uh, which is entitled Ein Ionenkäfig, uh, an ion trap by Wolfgang Paul, who is here. He is the inventor and he got a patent for that. And this Paul trap essentially is a device, as indicated here, which shows a hyperbolic potential shape where you apply voltages, a DC voltage and an AC voltage, uh, to create on the inside of this ca cage a field with which you can trap atoms, even single atoms. And that is now the starting point for very many investigations that we had. Now, when we talk about experimenting with single atoms, we can ask another authority who then said, even in the 50s, in the first place, it's fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise Ichthyosauria in the zoo. And a little bit below, he says, this is the obvious way of registering the fact that we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariably entails ridiculous consequences. Now, this is uh, something nice to hear, but and, uh, we hopefully could prove him wrong uh, by making these things visible. Also, you have seen in the talk this morning already that the first experiment is showing that actually single atoms can be confined and can be observed. This is a picture of a single ion right there. This little speck, it's hard to see. This is actually a picture of three ions in the ion trap, which miniaturized, so we just have one millimeter ring diameter right here. And the famous paper by Neuhauser uh, Hohenstadt, Toschek, and Demelt some time ago. And in the 80s, when we had the high time of quantum optics, where the power trap was applied to these single particles, we saw single ions, laser cooling realized with that. We saw precision spectroscopy for the first time with single atoms, serving for frequency standards. Quantum optics was newly investigated, measuring correlation functions like anti-punching a single ion here in the group of uh, Herbert Walter in Munich. We saw dark resonances with all the subject of the talks and future seminars. Then the quantum jumps have been observed in Hamburg and Peter Toschek's group. You see here a trace of quantum jumps observed in, in barium ions. And ion crystals have at that time already been investigated in Herbert Walter's group and many other things. So the 80s were a high time for applying all these tools and developing uh, first experiments with ions, ion clouds, multipole traps, 
the theory has it made advances, and sideband cooling was involved for the first time. That led then to the recognition of the iron traps, and uh, so Wolfgang Paul and Hans Demel jointly got the Nobel Prize for the development of the iron trap technique. Wolfgang Paul, especially for the radio frequency trap that I just alluded to, and Hans Demel for his investigations using the so-called penning trap, relying on magnetic fields and DC electric fields. So this is then the starting point in the 90s when many of these experiments began and the theory advances were there. One of the, I think, first, for me, a very important paper was that we studied in, uh, quantum optics, the correlation functions, and we really had a new treatment of cooling and drops. This is a paper which is not often read, but I think it's one of the basic points where we started to realize that the Paul trap actually can do much more than it was used to doing in the 80s. This was the starting point for me for many of these uh, quantum investigations that we do nowadays with ion traps. And then this came along at the same time, we recognized that here, and this was at the same time realized that an ion trap system is exactly the same as a cavity QED system, where the cavity frequency is replaced by the trap frequency of the ion in the trap. So we could actually do, and that's the notion, cavity QED without a cavity. So this is an important realization. And then another important starting point was when we sat together, this was together Ignacio, Peter and I, we were the three working in Boulder at that time, we sat together in a talk by Arthur Eckert on the International Conference on Atomic Physics, where for the first time we heard about quantum information and the realization of uh, the Shaw algorithm with these quantum computers. And that was the starting point for many discussions. We realized immediately that the Paul trap certainly is, of course, a very good tool to apply it for quantum information processing. And then uh, almost only a year later, or just a few months later, Ignacio Sirak and Peter Sola came up with a famous re proposal to realize quantum computation with trap ions published here in 1995. And then uh, very soon after that one, after the experiment started in Boulder, in Innsbruck and Oxford, the Boulder group of Dave Weinland already published the first gate operation according to the Sirak Solar idea, but realized with a single ion and uh, a cube uh, in motion in quantum. So this was the real starting point of exploring the quanta and quanta, the quantum with ion traps. And the 90s then for the subsequent five, six, seven years after the early 2000s saw a heavy development of the tools and methods for measuring and manipulating individual quantum systems. This was recognized then uh, in the Nobel Prize 2012, as you all know, uh, to, uh, awarded to Dave Weinland and uh, Sasha Roche for the groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Here, we use photons to investigate these trapped atoms, or trapped ions in this case. Here, uh, Serge's group used then atoms to investigate trapped photons in this cavity. And these systems have been shown to be equivalent, and this was now the, the basis for very many experiments exploring the quantum. Now, as I said before, for me, a very important point was the starting point in the mid-90s to do quantum information processing with this. After we had all these things, what can we do with that? Now, the question really is, why would we want to explore quantum computers? Now, the generic answer to that is, of course, there must be some applications in physics and mathematics. And the entire hype started, as I said, in 1994, when Peter Shaw came up with that algorithm that we heard about in that conference in 1994. The algorithm which allows you to factor numbers on a quantum computer, if you had one, much faster than on a classical computer. Why is this interesting? This could be a number uh, crunching problem, which is not very interesting. But it's a fact, a very interesting problem because most of the encryption uh, algorithms rely on the fact that you cannot fast enough uh, factor large numbers. So factoring large numbers would enable you uh, to uh, immediately crack some codes and to, to see through messages which are encrypted. So a number of agencies became immediately interested because that uh, algorithm showed that the factorization of numbers with L digits scales on a quantum computer only polynomially, where of course the efforts grow exponentially on a classical computer. This was realized by uh, Peter Shaw and he came up with that algorithm. A little later, Love Grover from uh, at and he came up with another uh, algorithm where he showed that even the search uh, of in a database could uh, be uh, uh, speed up 
uh, quite a bit by using so the superpositions uh, that you have available in the system. So in fact, where a classical computer needs queries on the order of the number of the entries, a quantum computer would only use the square root of the number of entries for that. But personally, what I find, and this is currently a hot topic, is that simulation of Schrodinger equations that was alluded to already by Feynman in the 80s and was sort of an exotic uh, way of uh, doing this, that this is now a hot topic. Uh, this personally, I think, is something that I would like to uh, sh show you a little bit more on in the later part of the talk. This is something that we will really apply these quantum computers long before we do the number crunching on these areas. And something that has not been also uh, well realized is that that was shown again by the Wineland group some time ago. In spectroscopy, it was shown that a quantum computer can be used as an atomic state synthesizer. What do I mean with that? In fact, you can use these days a quantum computer to produce at will a state with which you can enhance measurement sensitivities, for example. You can enhance uh, this system, you can design your system, especially for any measurement you want, frequency measurements, for example, force measurements, whatever you like. And this state synthesizer project enables one to use to uh, small quantum computers, for example, to really get better measurements, to inc get another few orders of magnitude, maybe not 10 orders of magnitude, as Serge pointed out in the future, but we certainly will gain uh, another sensitivity uh, using these objects. And last but not least, personally for me, I find we are now looking at quantum physics with a renewed view. We are looking at it with what I call the information-guided eye. What do I mean with that? If you look at computer science as it was before, for example, the notion of error correction is ubiquitous. This, for a long time, was thought, thought to be impossible for quantum information processing, because error correction really means you recognize there is an error, so you measure a system, then you undo the error. That's what classical uh, error correction does. In quantum physics, of course, that's not possible due to the no cloning theorem that we know about. So you cannot read the system. You have to find a way to see that is an error and what the error really is and then undo it. I don't have the time to go through this in this lecture today, uh, but this is what we can do. And I had to learn that the hard way 15 years ago, I did not believe it, but this is definitely true. And we have shown that this works. So this is now a renewed view onto quantum uh, physics. And, uh, this is, uh, and also if you look at entropies and other things, I think this is a, a, a very important point, from, uh, point and reason to look at and uh, the exploration of quantum computers in the future. So let's get started. What do we need in order to make a quantum computation? This was nicely summarized by the so-called DiVincenzo, by David DiVincenzo, the so-called DiVincenzo criteria. And first of all, you need a scalable physical system with well-characterized qubits. A qubit is a quantum bit, the equivalent of a classic bit. I'll come back to that. And you need the ability to initialize the, style, the state of these qubits to arbitrary input states because you want to make a universal computation and start from arbitrary inputs. Then, of course, you want to have long co relevant coherence times, much longer than the individual gate operation because you want to keep the quantumness of the system for a long time. And, of course, you want to have a universal a computer, so you better have a universal set of quantum gate operations. And finally, depending on how you implement it, you need the measurement capability, which of course is specific to the implementation. A little later, he came up with two more of these uh, uh, commandments, as I, I call them these days. Uh, it's about networking. It's a, you need the ability to interconvert a stationary in a flying qubit, where a flying qubit is usually tantamount to using the word photon. So you have a photon that you convey over distances. Could be a microwave photon, could be a, uh, an optical photon. And of course, you need to be able to faithfully transmit the flying qubit between some specif specified locations to do real networking. And if you have a system that you want to investigate for that, uh, then you better look for these seven commandments first. What do I mean by quantum bit? So let's just go through that. A classical bit, as you all know, is uh, just a classical object, a physical object in a state zero, like the switch uh, uh, and, the, and, and the one, the switch position down, for example. The register, then, is nothing else but a bit row, as we have it in our Pentium computers or these Intel computers that uh, power up all these laptops. There's 32 bits, usually, and this is just a bit row. But a quantum bit is then the generalization. It's our old-fashioned two-level system. So we write it down as, say, the superposition has two orthogonal states. And we generalize now the register to a quantum register. So we take L of those two-level systems. And clearly, we have two to the L quantum states. 
So far, there's not much different. So what is really different now? If we just now write the quantum state, then of course, we have to write it down in this, this notation. This notation says, okay, we cannot really independently write these states as we would do in a classical way because the state of the register could be in an arbitrary superposition. Or in other words, if I just change something on the last qubit here, then the entire uh, space would be affected because I have a superposition. This is non-local. Whereas in a classical way, I just would change the, the one, say, to a zero, and the rest of this could not care less what I've done on the last position right here. This kind of uh, parallelism that we reach by the superposition principle and later on entanglement, this is exactly what speeds up these processes. And this is sometimes called the quantum parallelism because the many computational paths that we actually get interfere. So it's an interference pattern that we want to read in order to produce the result. So for example, when you have the computational space, then we talk about here qubits and the computational paths. They grow as 2 to the n. Then you see already for 64 qubits, this is a very large number, 10 to the 19 uh, computational paths that you would have to control in order to make an interference possible. In other words, if I had, say, 300 qubits, we don't need gigabits or megabits. We just need 300 atoms to do this. The number of computational paths, if you can control them, exceeds already the numbers of atoms in the universe. I can't even tell you what that really means, what we have to do with that. That is an enormous way of uh, controlling a huge Hilbert space, and I don't know how we, we should be able to do that. I don't see a roadblock to, see, to, to, not, to not do this, but I really don't know exactly what that means. We can come back to that in the discussion. So what are the universal gate operations? We need uh, to create superpositions of a single qubit. So this is done usually by one-bit rotation, so we need to be able to to tilt the block vector uh, about a certain angle. We have to, we have to uh, have to have the ability to position at a certain place at will. And as Di Vincenzo showed, we need a gate operation. And that gate operation, I don't go through the details here, is in the simplest version, a so-called C-naught gate operation, which is analogous to the classical Boolean exclusive OR operation. I've written down here the, the truth table of the classical Boolean operation, which is simply saying, if I have an input bit and an output bit, every time the output bit is set to one, the, uh, sorry, the input bit is set to one, the output bit is then flipped. This would be the classical operation. But this is already written in the Brown Cat notation, alluding to the fact that this has to hold now for superpositions and not just for the state probabilities. And that's the hard part. This is what we call then controlled not gate operation. That needs to be realized. But that was shown already in the mid-90s, uh, together with single qubit rotations, to be a universal set of gate operations. So in other words, if you could realize these two gate operations, then you already have shown that in principle you can build a quantum computer, a universal quantum computer. So we have already a recipe how a quantum computer looks like. So we start out from an arbitrary superposition right here in our register, and then we have a process that is broken down, and we end up with a superposition right here. That quantum process right here can be broken down according to what I just said in single qubit operations and the two qubit operations of the C0 type. And of course, the order in which they have to be arranged is due to the underlying algorithms that we run, and a certain compiler or programmer has to do this for you or you do it yourself, whatever, and then you just program it. This is called, called circuit diagram of a, a circuit quantum computation as an ordinary quantum computation, and then you end up with the, uh, another superposition. But of course, all these are rotations on block spheres. So these are unitary processes if you do not have any decoherence. So in principle, I can revert the process. It's completely reversible. I have not gained any classical information. The classical information I gain only when I just project the outcome of that superposition to the basis I have here, the eigenbasis system. And then from that, I gain the information. So in fact, it was now realized by Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zola to how to really implement that particular c naught gate operation. That was the hard part. How do I make one atom switch its state depending on the excited state amplitude of a first atom? That is the hard part, and that was realized in this famous paper. I'll come back to that in a minute. We have seen later uh, more gate operations that uh, actually do this uh, uh, task by uh, Milman and Sorensen, Milburn, Saguri, Solano, there's a, base, a gate based on light shifts by Jonathan Blaney and Knight. Geometric phases have been put forward by D.D. Leibold and Dave Vineland. 
So let's uh, see how these things work. But before we do that, let's go back and see how we realize with these trapped ions now our qubits. Remember, a qubit was a two-level system. So for the two-level systems, we have two kinds that we usually use. And this is what I call an optical qubit, so where we have a transition in the optical domain. And this is a, what I call the, the, the hyperfine or Zeeman qubit, or microwave transition. We just use a two-level system in the hyperfine uh, manifold or in the Zeeman manifold. And this is usually done with, of course, the odd isotopes. You see here all the places where this is being pursued. Uh, the optical qubit is mostly done in Innsbruck. There are other experiments right now available. And I will mostly talk here about this optical qubit, although you can just replace all things that I'm showing you with uh, similar things that's done here, but you would have to employ Raman transitions. So you see, this is the number of atoms in blue that are investigated for qubit operations. I will simply uh, limit this talk mostly to the calcium, and I won't talk about anything else here, but there are many other experiments going on in the world. Then what are the traps? Now the Powell trap that you've seen initially was a radius spherically symmetric trap where you can hold a single ion. Here we want to have a string of ions because we want to have a register. So we want to keep these ions in a line, and that's the variant of the Powell trap. We're using here a variant of the Powell mass filter by just using these four rods, for example, and wind rings around it so we just keep the ions right here. Then the rings can be replaced by so-called segments. So it's a segmented trap that was developed in Boulder, first place in the mines. Uh, we are using this knife edge trap because it provides a very stiff confinement on the axis. There's even other variants like segmented traps, miniaturized traps, so I'll come back to that. They were developed in Munich and in Sussex for the first time. The trap that we are using here is this old-fashioned trap that we are still using since the year 2000. And for the remainder of this uh, seminar, it is suf it's sufficient for you to remember that this trap provides a harmonic oscillator for a trapped particle. And that harmonic oscillator, of course, is characterized only by three trap frequencies. So the trap frequency along the axis, that's about one megahertz, depending on the voltages that you apply. And radially to that one, it's the X and Y frequency is typically, typically about two megahertz for a calcium ion. I'll come back to that. So the sizes are here, as you can see in this picture, about one millimeter laterally and about six millimeters between these tips. So this is what we have at the workhorse, and this is the picture that you saw on the very first image that I've shown you. Let's come back now to the Xerox solar idea. We know how to store these ions in the drop, so we set them side by side. We encode our information, the quantum information, in either narrow, or narrow optical resonances and ground state, or ground state Zeeman coherences, doesn't really matter. The really important part now for the realization of the Xerox solar quantum computer is this state vector. The state vector writes down the state of the system in such a way that all the internal degree of freedoms, that is to say, whether this or that or that atom has an internally excited state or not, is written right here. And it's just uh, written down in such a way that it's all in the center of mass motion with a zero quantum number. So you have a joint harmonic oscillator of the entire chain, which is really put down in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. That is a hard demand, but let's see why this is necessary. Sirac and Solar in those days, they realized the following. You actually want to make this kind of an operation. That is, you want to flip that state in a coherent fashion, depending on the state of this ion. But why the heck should that ion actually know that this ion has an excited state? And the idea is as follows. First, address a laser, point, a laser to this point right here on this ion, and then rewrite the internal information, which is right here, to a one of the center of mass motion. Remember, these ions are charged, and they are sitting still because they're in the ground state. So when I just make that operation, then all of a sudden the ground, the excited state, the internal amplitude is no longer there, but I do have then an excitation. I just create one motion, one phonon of motion. Of course, that ion, of course, creates then a repelling force the entire chain starts to move. And from the point of view of the motion, of the, of the chain, the, the chain couldn't care less where the motion was put in. It doesn't know, in quotation marks, where the motion came in. This is not knowing. This is something you can describe as creating entanglement between the internal degree of freedom and the external degree of freedom. Now we go to the second ion, and we make a transition if and only if there was a motion. I'll show you in a minute how to do that. And finally, we go back and take the motion out, so we rewrite. This, the zero right here, and rewrite the amplitude into the ion. 
So we leave the controlling bit alone and we have switched if and only if, the, the, the target bit if and only if there was um, uh, an excited state amplitude. That, of course, experimentally needs efficient uh, and in, uh, individual addressing, efficient single qubit operations. Of course, you don't want to get things out of phase while you do this, so you need a small decoherence of the internal and emotional states. And finally, you have to realize for a longer computation this as a series of all these laser pulses that you apply to these systems. Well, let's see how this works. This is as it looks like uh, in a uh, diagrammatic point of view. This is the trap as we have it, so we apply laser beams in order to the laser pooling and the individual addressing. And we routinely observe the resonance fluorescence here with the CCD camera. And if you want to know more details of the latest setup, that's here. This is typically what we work with. This is a chain of ions of, say, 15 ions in this case. Each ion can be individually addressed. The distance between the innermost ions is on the order of about 4 microns. So we just have to address precisely, and then we can just affect these things. Now, let's just see the level scheme. What is the qubit again? Here is our calcium plus ion. And this is a transition which is a quadruple transition with a lifetime of about one second. So we just have a long enough coherence time when we manipulate the qubit on this transition, which requires, by the way, a laser which is subhertz, which is another task, but this is doable. Then, uh, in order to measure that, we have this laser. Uh, when you just uh, shine the laser in, of course, and the system is down at the ground state, then, of course, you scatter lots of light. But if the system is projected to the excited state, then, of course, the electron is not available to shuttle back and forth. So then you don't see the light. This is the observation of the quantum jumps we referred to before. And this is what we now routinely use to detect the state. So in other words, we call this it's a projective measurement, but it's a sigma z measurement for obvious reasons. Now, we use this now also with these numbers of ions when we are in the, in, in the trap, and we see these histograms automatically, and they're routinely explored by a, a computer, a classical computer. We know immediately when we see here, then we have three excitations here, we have no excitations, and so forth. This is how a computer immediately sees with 99.9% .9 detection uh, efficiency what the state, the classical state vector really is. Now, remember, we have this two-level system sitting in this harmonic trap. In principle, we would have to rearrange the Hamiltonian in such a way that we write down the entire manifold. So we have lots of two-level systems which are just different by the trap frequency in U. But then, of course, when we apply the laser, then we have several possibilities. Applying the laser on resonance would just to connect that harmonic oscillator in the ground state with a quantum number n to the excited state with the same number n. So this is what we call a carrier. You'll see that in the spectral decomposition in a minute. But this is the reason why we call it that way. But you could also see an excitation possible on the lower sideband. So this would really mean we make an excitation and lose then one motion, uh, motion in the quantum. But then, of course, predominantly the system decays on its own eigenstate right here. So this is just the decay, and it climbs down the ladder until, in the end, it resides in the low state. This is the optical pumping process of the motion. It's called sideband cooling. The reason is we apply the sideband radiation, the red sideband here, and pump everything to the ground state. This is the way to prepare the initial state of the Xerox Solar quantum computer. Then what remains in the lowest state are three excitations. This is what we call the carrier, the blue sideband, and the red sideband. And clearly you can see the carrier is able to manipulate the qubit, so this is what we use to internally make uh, superpositions or the sidebands, they could be either on the red or on the blue sideband, they can manipulate the motion at the qubit. So they just allow us to take out or put in one sideband in the system, so one motion. This is how we manipulate sing single quanta of motion in the system. Then this is, as I said before, the creation of entanglement, and this is how we do this in the entire chain. And that this works is shown here. So when we just make a carrier excitation, you see here, uh, these Rabi flops on the carrier, they go with the two pi time, in about 10 microseconds, we can do it a little faster, but not much with these trap frequencies. That's the typical time scale. But when you just make, say, the blue side by an excitation right here, you have an excitation of the internal degree of freedom, but at the same time, the external degree of freedom, you create one phonon. And when you do that, this goes much slower. And the reason for that is that uh, multiplied by the so-called lambda parameter, it's like a modulation index. So it's essentially the ratio of the extension of the ion in the ground state, which is for a calcium about seven nanometers, divided by the wavelength, which is about 700 nanometers. So this is typically a percent. 
or this is even a little less here. So this is typically what we use if you make the red sideband or the blue sideband excitation. Of course, when we would make a red sideband excitation starting from the ground set, there would be nothing left. So that's why we usually use the blue sideband side band here. With this in hand, we now we can realize already all the gate operations and algorithms, as I said before, are broken down in these sequences of single and two qubit operations. The gate operations are realized simply by carrier rotations and these sideband operations in the right sequences right here. And the analysis is done by measuring the probabilities of finding the individual qubits in their excited state. But of course, that would just give you the populations. How would you get the coherences in the larger space? And for this, you need to rotate all the qubits prior to making a measurement. This is like an, an ordinary medical uh, imaging process is called tomography because you rotate your system, uh, the magnetic field, or you rotate the patient or whatever you do in order to get uh, these, uh, these images. And this is what we do when we get the projections. In this case, this is the fingerprint of, say, a bell state that we created here. And uh, from this, we can see how well we can do that. And uh, uh, this is as, as usual uh, analysis tool. I'll show you in a minute also how to measure entanglement via parity oscillations. This is a spectroscopic tool which we also apply. But this is typically what we do. And in this way, we just can uh, prepare and uh, analyze uh, the push of a button all the belt states, which can then be uh, analyzed here, for instance, with the fidelity, that's the overlap between the wanted state and the ideal state. The entanglement of formation is a, a information a, a way of me measuring uh, or what's better known is how well you can violate the Bell inequality. You see this is by very many standard deviations the, the case. So this is one thing to do. But of course you can go on and do this with more ions, three or four. So you can create here the famous Greenberg or horn Salinger states, which is all ions down and up in the superposition, for example. And this is for three or four states. And this is analyzed uh, again with these tools. So you see that this is always a fingerprint. Uh, measurement and you get this with the high fidelity. The biggest state that we've ever uh, analyzed in that way by making a full tomograph uh, tomographic measurement is an eight ion state. We call it a quantum byte. But remember, eight ions have to be prepared in the first place. That works fast in a few microseconds in the superposition. And then, by the way, this is so called W state. The W state is just one excitation distributed over all the ions. You don't know where it is, you just want to find out that it is in a superposition. Now, in order to do so, of course, you have to rotate each ion prior to making a measurement and you find out all combinations. So this is a, a matrix of about 256 and two times 256 entries, which really gives you an enormous amount of measurements. It required about 6,500 settings and a total of 10 measure hours measurement time. So this quantum computer was really running 10 hours uninterruptedly on itself, completely automatically uh, uh, stabilized and to produce this result. The difficulty came later when we really wanted to, uh, to, to, to show what is actually now from the classical information that I retrieve, what is the signature that this is really the state? Because when you just measure that, projections sometimes give you negative probabilities, negative entries with the density matrices, which is not real. So you want to fit the quantum state that fits best the observed data, and that took several days on the computer cluster. That already shows that in order to derive information from a quantum state requires exponential efforts. If you just add another qubit, you could have done that. It would have taken us not even a microsecond more. But it would not have been possible to calculate that and to measure that in the same fashion. This is still one of the problems we face with quantum computers. I'll come back to that a little later. So just to make a long story short, these are the things that we have done now in the, say, in the last decades between 2003 and maybe 2010, 2011. All of these processes, we don't, we don't want to go through these things. Just concentrate on these numbers. So we just can produce single qubit operations, all these things with very high fidelities. But uh, if it comes to a so-called Toffoli operation, this is a controlled, controlled not operation which you need also for some processes, then it already goes down to 70%. But if you really want to do now a calculation that's fault tolerant and uh, that enables you to do quantum error correction to really get a calculation going over a long time, then one can show you need way better fidelities than 99%. There was no way that we could ever meet this requirement. And how do we do this? We thought about this and we investigated for a long time how we can improve the system. 
And the idea came from uh, these two gentlemen. This is Klaus Möllmer and Anders Sörensen from uh, Aarhus and, uh, uh, at that time. And the question really is, uh, how, we, how, how can you can generate entanglement? So let's just concentrate on the case of two ions. And here I've written, say, two ions, which are sitting side by side, both ions, for example, in the ground state or both ions in the excited state. The basic operation that you need is an entanglement operation. Entangling, say, two ions would be to create a superposition of both ions in the ground state and both ions in the excited state. And if you write it down in a fashion where you have all the intermediate states possible, then you see there's a number of two photon transitions possible if you apply, say, bichromatic light. So you apply a light which is close to the red sideband and bichromatic and the other frequency light which is close to the blue sideband. But because you have so many uh, ways that you can go, and there's only three excitations close to the ground state possible, then you see there's four pathways that you have here. And these people showed in the theoretical paper that when you just add up all these pathways and just to see how they, uh, how they create a probability to generate the superposition of an excited state right here of two ions simultaneously, then these pathways interfere in such a way that they can create just the direct superposition of these hyperbloch spheres, when you, so, when you want to say so. And that is a very nice idea. So we just can apply, in this case, uh, two uh, laser frequencies at the same time, bichromatic, but at the same time, they're also symmetric about their atomic transitions. So fortuitously, then we avoid also residual dark shifts, which we had to fight in the old Xerox solar idea. And more importantly, they, sh they showed also that this, because it interferes, uh, destructively, the parts interfere destructively, you see, in the immediate state, dependence doesn't show up in first order. It's only dependent on the quantum number n in second order. So no matter when you just end up by any uh, erroneous uh, operation, not quite in the ground state, as in, in necessary for the Sirac solar idea, you still can do operations which you couldn't do otherwise with the Sirac solar idea. So this is what we tried to implement. Actually, this was in a fashion implemented already by the Wineland group in 2000, where they had to use the Raman transitions to show this. But here, they had to fulfill then the requ uh, some geometrical requirements, so the beams had to come from two different sides. Whereas in the optical setup that we have, these beams can come from the same side. So it's just applying two frequencies to one acoustic optic modulator. Experimentally, this is easy. Now let's come back. How do we measure entanglement? Remember, what you really want to see uh, is that you create, say, from the state that you prepare initially by optical pumping in the ground state, a superposition of both ions in the ground state and in the D state. This would make a correlation of states or the entangled state. Now, a way to measure entanglement, uh, say, superpositions is, as we heard already this morning, is uh, making Ramsey spectroscopy. So, for example, you apply a pi over 2 pulse, and you wait a little bit and make another pi over 2 pulse, and you vary the phase. Then you would expect to see Ramsey fringes the period that varies with pi, uh, 2 pi in this case. But once you now make a correlation, this is a shortcut notation for the c naught gate operation, so you create these states in a correlated way, they go in lockstep. But of course then the phase, of course, evolves on this ion and it evolves on this ion, so in total they evolve twice as fast. When you just make that and now determine so how often you find things in the same state and you add these probabilities and to subtract how often you find them in opposite states, this is something we call a parity signal. Then you find, all of a sudden, that this signal then uh, varies with twice the angle that you just apply here. And this shows you that there is a correlation between the two states. So from that measurement alone, spectroscopy, you can infer that there is entanglement in the first place. And from the visibility of the spectroscopic signal, you can derive the fidelity. So this is a measurement that we did and we still do routinely. And now when you apply the bichromatic light, so we have two ions, and we apply not uh, this parity signal, we just want to measure the probabilities. And uh, the probabilities first, if you just start in the ground state, it's one of finding both ions in the ground state. The probability for finding both ions in the, in the excited state is the blue one. It's zero to begin with. Then we just the length of the pulse. And the red curve is the probability for finding either one in the excited state. So one in the excited and the other one in the ground state. Then you apply this at a certain time, and here you realize, aha, apparently there's an interference happening. This interference of having either one in the excited state is zero. 
but we see they meet right here. So you expect at this point a perfect superposition of both ions in the grounds and the excited state. And at that point we stop the gate operation and then we just investigate how well we see this parity signal. And you see here from the oscillation already the visibility is clearly near to one and this allows you to measure then the fidelities and you get the fidelity here of the operations of 99.3%. This was the position where we wanted it to be before we can really make now these operations. What does that mean? We just have these two operations, here, the two ions sitting right there and they, we have a bichromatic radiation which talks to the intermediately to the ion motion right here. In fact, when you write down the mathematics, and I don't want to go through this, you can show that this is a spin-spin interaction. It's like a spin-spin interaction that you write down. So in other words, the Hamiltonian that effectively needs to be written down as the interaction that you mimic with that gate operation is the sigma x term, term sigma x term. But this can be generalized, and this is a very powerful and general operation because you can have many more ions talk to the same motion because they all undergo the same motion. And you do, if you do now the bichromatic excitation, then you find that you can create this more generalized Hamiltonian so they talk all to each other. And that lends itself to making ZHC states immediately in one go. This is a very powerful operation. Let me just show you how this works. When you just apply that, say, for a single line right here, you make a, a two lines, so it's a superposition right here with two pathways if you start only from zero. So there's only the two pathways available. Then you create that superposition, so you make a build state, we know that. When you just do this for four ions, then of course you get all these excitations and the different pathways, and uh, then of course they can go immediately to different pathways right here, and finally uh, interfere in such a way that uh, they just give you the, uh, the, the condition with which you create that GHC state. But this can be generalized. Now if you have eight ions and do the same thing, this is what really happens. So now you see the interference happening, these multi-path interference that I've talked to you, the quantum parallelism that happens. You don't get anything for free. This requires that you keep that interferometer stable through all these pathways. You have to control all these beam paths. It's not for free. But once you're able to control that interference pattern, then you have a powerful way of making this happen and making these computations. Let me just briefly show you what we did with this. So this would be a single ion Ramsey fringe. This is for two ions. You see these parity signals. And here are the respective fidelities that you get. We can carry out this even for 14 ions in this case. And this is just a different way of measuring the, uh, the, the way whether they are entangled or not. This is a fidelity criterion that we got from this paper. You see, this is still uh, entangled by 17 sigma. So in this way, we can have entanglement creation in a single go with a single pulse that we apply for a few microseconds. So this is a very powerful uh, operation that we use. So the toolbox that we have now is different as the one that we had before for the Sirac solar idea. As the entangling operation, we use this two-photon uh, transition as you have it here. So it's essentially, because it, there's many atoms involved, the Sx squared. Sx is a spin sum, and we use this as an Sx squared operation. Uh, that's this uh, notation that we chose because that goes into the Hamiltonian. But we also can use now then a global operation, but it's uh, actually a global operation, but yet local because it just acts resonantly on each atom individually. So we make rotations about uh, the x and y axis by the, the angle theta, depending on how long we apply it. And thirdly, we can make uh, then off resonant excitation. So we can apply a laser to each ion individually, and we tune this now off resonance, and we make AC stark shift, so that realizes the sigma C operation. So the, the basic Hamiltonians that we have available are then sigma X and sigma Y operations, sigma C operations, but then also the sigma X squared operations here. So the paradigm for the quantum computer as we have it now over the last five years is slightly different. This is what you've seen before. We start from a superposition and end with a superposition. Everything is broken down according to Sirac Solar and single and two qubit operations. The way we do it now is we are using the more complex and powerful Neumann Sorensen gate operations, single uh, uh, stack shift operations, collective yet local operations, and so forth. And of course, this gives you a much richer way of doing these things, uh, of programming your quantum computer. So this looks then in such a way, the real implementation is now in such a way that we apply the beam along the axis for the entangling operations or for the collective operations, and the local operations we just apply by individual addressing in a very fast way. But this gives you now 
many more operations that you actually need. Now the set of operations is not unique anymore. How do you find the best way of doing this? So you have to optimize this. And we came up with a program, and we wrote this over the last few years, and I'm still improving that, which uses optimal control theory. If you just look, for instance, in optimal control theory, you most often look in NMR experiments, how to reach a final state uh, from an initial state, and usually what you do is just make an amplitude modulation of the interactions. This is what we want to do, but not quite so, because we want to do this in a digital way, so we want to have pulses. So we are looking for a time-ordered sequence uh, where we optimize these coefficients in such a way that we can apply a unitary gate operation, which is then comprised of little gates that we actually do. And for technical reasons, we uh, restrict ourselves to the smallest gate lengths of pi over 8 rotations. But this uh, is not a necess necessary condition. It just simplifies our life. And we use sort of a grape algorithm. Details don't really matter to optimize this. But in any case, when we now do such an, uh, 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 a computation, we compile first all things from the high language that we write down and uh, say C0 gate operations, as you would know it from uh, quantum information uh, part here. You, uh, part, you just would now write down the sequence in radio frequency pulses. And I can't intuitively see how these radio frequency pulse sequence appears from what you do. This is just done by the optimal control. Now let me just show you, uh, in the end, a few uh, transparencies and how we do now the, these quantum computations. We have done all these things. We have done quantum Fourier transforms. We have done a Shor algorithm. We have order finding quantum error correction. I don't have the time to go through this. If you really want to know more what algorithms are available, then they still find this book the most comprehensive and very nice book by Mike, Ike and Mike, Mike Nielsen and Ike Chuang. Uh, I want just to give you two examples here on the analog and digital simulations that we performed. So let's see, what is an analog quantum simulator? The goal is, of course, to simulate the physics of a, a quantum system of interest by another system that's easier to control and to measure. That's as was set out. So for instance, we could use now a system Hamiltonian that depends on certain parameters. And we could try to match that parameter exactly matching the system at hand. So we would try to emulate our system into our quantum system by reinterpreting the, these operations. And this is what we call an analog quantum simulator. Examples you can find here uh, when you just would go, for, say, from a superfluid uh, state here to a mod insulator, want to study the phase transition, uh, ultra hold atoms and optical lattices, you have these here as well. Then uh, you see that could be done in such a way. You implement, uh, you embed your system into a cold atom system to study it. Or if you want to study magnetic magnetism, you just have these ion crystals and you just study phase transitions right here. And there's a, a nice review where you can see more of these details. Let me just give an example. Suppose we had now our ion chain, as we have them in the trap, n ions. And now we want to have them interact on the transverse side. This is for technical reasons. If we really want to implement, say, Hamiltonian, which is studied in many places, so the easing Hamiltonian, so we have a spin-spin interaction. And we have here a non-commuting term, the interaction with the transverse field. This is something, as you remember, we can actually do because we have the sigma i, sigma j interaction with our member Sorensen gate operations. And these are the stark shifts. So we have the tools with which we can implement these operations. So the idea is then to realize various coupling matrices. These coupling matrices right here can be shown to be, have a power law dependence. So you can study, say, infinite range interactions that all talk to each other or Coulomb interactions up to dipole-dipole interactions. And we studied in this particular case just the case where the B field is larger than uh, the maximum of the JIJ. So we, it's a case of hot, uh, hopping hardcore bosons. Doesn't really matter. I'll come back to the, uh, the gist of this in a minute. Why is this interesting? Now, it was shown over the last years, when you just create correlations in the larger systems, they can propagate in a certain fashion in such a way, uh, depending on the, the range of the interactions. If the interactions between, here's a spin chain, for example, the number of spin from 0 to 100, uh, the short range interaction, then of course, if you have an excitation right here, these quartic particles, the magnetization, for example, that spreads like a light cone. And then you see interferences here happening in the between. But if the interaction gets uh, longer and longer, so it really have a long range interaction, 
then there's no spreading in the uh, old-fashioned way. You see, the immediately seems to have an interference pattern everywhere. And this also created and uh, changes the way entanglement gets, uh, uh, um, uh, entanglement uh, just uh, goes through the system. And what we can see here is that the group velocity, for instance, becomes large. That's a theory, a theory prediction by Philip Pauke and uh, uh, Talia Kossi some time ago. How can we do this? We, you've seen they have these spin chains, so we just could prepare them all. And then we could just uh, prepare one in the opposite state. And that, of course, creates a little magnet. We flip one spin. We would simulate now the interaction by just shining in the lasers in appropriate fashion for a certain amount of time, which mimics exactly the easing Hamiltonian. We embed this, we emulate our easing Hamiltonian by using these operations. That would mean that the interaction starts for a certain amount of time, and then this entanglement starts to spread, and we just would have to measure the excited state amplitudes to see how the magnetization really is. The JIJ matrix, I don't want to go through the details, can be matched according to these things with the parameters that I've shown here, so we can really uh, get through all these things. To make a long story short, here's the experimental result. If you just take now, in this case, it's seven spins, and you make the center part uh, inverted, and you wait after you apply the interaction, then you see that this spreads out, gets reflected, there's interference happening all the time. So it's a quasi-particle dynamics that you can study. And there are many possibilities. You can make the excitation on one side, study how this interferes. You can just have two excitations, see how they cross and what the interaction is going to be. You can evaluate this in a different way by looking for the correlation functions. This is mostly done in the group by uh, Chris Monroe. This is the papers, they were just published side by side. This, these are our results. So it just shows you how we can just study magnetization and by the same token, we can just evaluate, because we have access, uh, access to individual addressing, we can evaluate uh, the entropy of the, the, the entanglement entropy so we just see what the uh, entanglement in the system is. And if you just look at the entanglement by measuring the concurrence, say, of these individual lines, see, this is three and five and uh, four, uh, two, two and uh, six, uh, right here and so forth, and you see this is uh, going through the system as a wave front. So it really marches through the system, so we see that entanglement propagates in this case. These are the ways with which you can actually investigate now quantum in a larger scale system, in a many body system. And this is to show you that this works also for 15 ions, and if you had only nearest neighbor interaction, you would expect that there's a light count spread, but of course it's hard to see in this color coding, we already see that, uh, that this light cone spreads much faster. This is the red curve than would be expected from the nearest neighbor interaction, which is known as the deep Robinson bound in solid state physics. So we see the experimentally observed magnon arrivals much earlier here for long range settings than it is expected otherwise. Just one way of showing is, is the, the, these uh, simulations. But we can also do digital operator simulations. Digital simulations, they were already uh, predicted by Feynman long time ago in the 80s. He said, why just uh, do uh, a simulation of something on a classic computer, which is so complicated as having superpositions, you will never be able to store all the information. And he suggested to use then a quantum computer. And this was really used, the quantum computer, as a quantum simulator in such a way that we just program the unitaries according to what the system Hamiltonian is supposed to do. So suppose you want to implement a system Hamiltonian in this kind, so you would have to break down your system into uh, the unitary operations that you do. But very often the Hamiltonian uh, consists of parts which do not commute with each other. In this case, you cannot simply do that in the way that I've shown you before, but then you have to resort to the so-called trotterization, which is uh, simply applying this approximation, so you just apply piecewise uh, Hamiltonians for a certain amount of time in slices and then repeatedly uh, uh, repeat them. Uh, this uh, something you can read in this uh, paper in more detail. Let me just show you briefly how this works. So we have a Hamiltonian that we write in this way. Remember the easing Hamiltonian that I showed you as an easy, uh, as an easy part. Then we have the universal encoding degrees of freedom. And we just build now the unitaries according to each part of this. This would be sigma x, sigma x, or sigma c, or whatever you have for sigma y, and so forth. And then we approximate the dynamics by this Trotter Suzuki formula. Uh, I've just replaced here this, uh, the angles by the faces right here, and then we repeatedly do this. In a more pictorial representation, this really means we apply the appropriate laser frequency, or the radio frequency pulse on the laser frequency for a certain amount of time, 
So the second Hamiltonian, the third Hamiltonian, and then repeat the steps often enough in order to, to see that this really converges. That this was shown to be efficient for local quantum systems, and this is what general uh, uh, quantum simulations allows, was shown in the seminal paper by Stess Lloyd already some time ago. Let me just show you in a toy, toy problem how this works. We have, for example, this two-spin easing system, and you see immediately this lends itself to impl implementing it right with the pulses that we have. This is the, the AC stock shifts, this is the mimos Sorensen gate operation. So we apply then these sequences in such a way that we first apply a Sorensen operation for a short amount of time, then an AC stock pulse, and then repeat the entire sequence. What we expect to see, for instance, for a two-spin system is how often the spins are up or how often the spins are down. Let me just see, I'll show you how this works. If we just slice it in two subsequent pulses, then you see these are the experimental pulses, they do not follow these lines nicely. But if you cut it finer and finer, the fidelity gets better, so the agreement between what we expect to see and what we uh, uh, do see in the experiment, and we cut it even finer, but here we don't see a further improvement. And the reason for that is that already we here, we have already a few hundred gate operations, which really makes us run out of steam because the individual fidelity is not yet good enough. But in principle, it works fine. And we have done uh, these digital gate operations, uh, digital simulations for up to six ions so far, and we are doing this for more complicated systems at the time. I would love to give you an outlook and give you more. Let me just uh, conclude with a few remarks on this. Uh, here is a, a simulation for four spins. The time dynamic dynamics in the system allows you to create complex eigenstates. We can explore the ground states and even quantum phase changes. The frequencies that you can derive from there just by a Fourier transform, they show you the gaps of the system. And I, I could give you all the details of the data. That's not the point of the matter right here. And it shows clearly that even for a more complex system, you could do that. For a spin system of four or five particles, of course, you can always calculate these things. But this is different when you go to a system of, say, 15, 20 particles, then it becomes really very difficult because uh, when you just uh, include all the, the generalized, uh, this is a, a single J coupling right here. If you have the JIJs, then it's really difficult. The eigenvalues and it could be embedded uh, and uh, directly measured by using a phase estimation algorithm in a quantum computation way. And of course, the current limited error sources are the laser fluctuations that we uh, have in the system and the complexity and the individual uh, fidelities. And also for a longer uh, way of making these computations go and studying the quantum uh, behavior, we would have to include error correction and error protection measures. Again, this is on the way and uh, this is currently being investigated. I would love to show you a little bit more how we can scale the quantum computer up as finishing this talk. This was realized already that uh, the Xerox Solar computer is going to be slow because when you add more ions, then of course the systems become heavier. It's very hard to set the systems to motion. Dave Weinand and uh, Dave Kulpinski realized that it early on and they suggested to use the so-called uh, uh, CCT, triplet charge, coupled trap, which really means you just break down the trap and segments. So we have storage areas, you have interaction areas, and you move the ions around. According to their ideas, this looks a little bit like Star Wars. So you know, you just move all these ions around and you have laser beams flashing around. So this is Didi Leifert and David Weinland's view of this. And in fact, uh, Ike Chuang from MIT has made some simulations how this really would work if you would implement, say, error correction in the system. Uh, by moving the ions back and forth and then having these flashes. The big advantage of that is that you could do this in parallel. You could just move these ions in parallel and make many operations at the same time. So this is being pursued at this time in many laboratories. And uh, in fact, there's no roadblock in sight that this couldn't work. Personally, I have my uh, reservations that this is necessary to move the ions all the way around. We have a slightly different way of doing this. But uh, again, this is currently uh, the pathway that very many people follow. For this, one also has, of course, to vary the traps. Instead of using these bulky traps that we have right now, we are going to uh, micro-sized traps as indicated right here. This trap was manufactured by us and by uh, Ferdinand schmidt kala who led the micro-trap consortium. And we have very many complicated traps these days with which we actually can move ions around and make more complex operations. And, uh, this is some of the complicated traps that we have available. This is the group again of Dave Weinland. And if you just look at this racetrack trap, this goes all the way around here. It's more than 200 segments. 
they even have a little flag here where the ion is supposed to stop. Okay, this is what we have already at the very advanced traps in, at NIST. Let me conclude with a few remarks here. There's many more things that we could show you how to scale this up. The techniques that are currently being investigated are cavity QED experiments where we combine cavities with atoms. And then the quantum information is, is written to a flying qubit that goes to another uh, node where it can be written, rewritten into an atom so that you can really do, that you can really entangle two separate atoms over larger distances. There's arrays in question. This has not been realized. There's some work on the way. There's ideas that are being carried out by Hartmut Heffner at Berkeley to wire up ions by just making them talk to each other via a wire, where we really talk these ions to the wire. Uh, we are using here dipole dipole coupling. Also, there's a paper by the group of Dave Weinert where we have shown that, uh, uh, that these ions can talk about longer distances because of their large dipole moments when they move in the trap. I could go on with this, and uh, I'm probably I'm stretching my time here. Let me just conclude by. Uh, I'm not showing you the details of this because that's going to be too long. Let me just, uh, I hope that should work here. Here, what the dream is and where we, are want to, where we want to go. The dream and the vision of this is that we really want to go to these local logical qubits. Personally, I don't think it's a viable idea to move every bit and qubit around all the time. We rather want to have q uh, groups of qubits that we have in certain pits which we can use as a logical qubit to encode it. And we have done some encoding of seven qubits at this stage. <clears throat> and that needs then a protection by error correction. The methods currently in vision to do that are so-called topological encoding, uh, where you really use a more complicated routine. But that gives you a very stable uh, way of encoding the qubits and a very unique way of deriving what the errors are to make active error correction. And the idea then would be to interconnect these qubits on a larger scale chip by dipole-dipole interactions on a chip, or if you have larger networks, to do really ion cavity interfaces. That's my dream. And we are working towards each bits and pieces towards it. Some of these Lego blocks are already working. Some others are not working. In any case, that's how we explore the quantum with ion traps. And if we explore quantum computations, this comes to mind. This is something I got uh, a few years ago from USA today. It's hard to read. It's a quantum computer. It wouldn't operate on anything so mundane as physical laws. It would employ quantum mechanics, which quickly gets into things such as teleportation and alternate universes, and is by all accounts the weirdest stuff known to man. OK, this is something we did. This is uh, probably heavy stuff. I don't think that we will do this in the near future. In any case, this is where we are. And Summarizing these things, of course, what we want in the future is more of everything. We want to have more qubits, better fidelities, faster gate operations. We already have these strengths in the, in, in the, the lab, and we almost can control them to the degree as we can control 20. Uh, that's the maximum that we have entangled so far. Uh, but uh, we have already studied the entanglement of these many particles. The idea is to go to more general two-dimensional traps on board addressing electronics, a lot of technology. and the question remains, how do we actually characterize this? That's another question that's currently being investigated. It's not clear in theory how to do that. And of course, the big question that I really want to achieve before I retire is the implementation of error correction routinely. Because what I really want to do, I want to keep the qubit alive. Once we have that, so that we keep superpositions and entanglement alive over longer times and longer distance scales, then we can do all of these things that have been suggested like uh, repeaters, metrology, simulations, computations at a large scale. But this is the major part. And with this, I'm ready. I just wanted to let you know there's a large team who does the work. There's a large number of sponsors. And here is our theory network. We have Peter Zoller and Philipp Hauke and uh, Markus Müller and Miguel Angel Martin de Garda from Madrid who are helping us with all the encoding and the theory for that. And of course, these are the names. And if someone wants to join us, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.